Hello, Wargamers. Alan Emmerich here from Victory Point Games. Whoops, wrong shoulder. There we go. To take you on a tour of Frank Chadwick's ETO in my very first tutorial video. Today I'm going to cover ETO, stacking, buildup, breakdown, so that you will understand how these units maneuver around the map and organize. Let's hit the map. All right. Your, um, your units in ETO uh, have a stacking limit. There's so many guys you can fit on a hex. And the stacking limit is really easy, actually. It's three units. Uh, one of each size, small. Well, here, let me zoom in. You can have one small size unit, which is a Soviet Corps or a German division, one medium size unit, and one large size unit. The game revolves around medium size units. It's basically a core level game. Um, the Soviets, of course, have to play with a lot of large army size units, which can get unwieldy. So the stacking limit is three, one of each size. But you can always substitute a smaller unit for a larger unit of your three. So this hex is perfectly valid having two small units and one large unit, for example. Or having, uh, uh, let's see, two medium units is also perfectly fine. They could have one small unit in this hex as well with these two. So... Three, two, one. Uh, but you couldn't have two large units in a hex. You can you can substitute a smaller unit for a larger unit, but you can't go the other way around. Okay, so that's the stacking limit. What you need to know is in ETO, small units have no zone of control. Zone of control, typical wargaming term. It means that you influence the six hexes adjacent to a unit. This medium unit has a zone of control. Medium units and large units are collectively called major units. They have zones of control and uh, which prohibit enemy movement and block enemy uh, rail movement, lines of communication, supply. So that's all good stuff. Small units don't do that. Uh, I mean, they're great, as you'll see, but they don't have a zone of control, and that is their uh, fatal flaw. All right. The other thing you need to know about stacking is how many units can attack across a hex side. The answer is you can attack through a hex side. If this guy was attacking him, for example, you can attack with one unit, one major unit per hex side, plus one minor unit per hex side. So if the German Third Panzer Army were going to be attacked by this these Soviet armies here, one major unit per hex side is all that's allowed, but in this hex you could also attack with one minor unit, and let's see who's home. So that would be an extra cavalry division. So here you'd have four attack factors, the first number, plus 12 is 16, plus 12 more for this is 28, plus 2 from a horse makes 30. Oh, we need two more factors to reach 32. What do we do? Well, in our uh, special movement phase, we would move this cavalry unit with the <clears throat> yellow movement allowance. Yellow and white movement allowances are uh, that are dis uh, whether they're engaged with an enemy unit or not, in its zone of control or not, they can move in the special movement phase, which occurs just before combat. So now suddenly we've got 14 from here, 28, 32 to 16. Oh my goodness! You know what that looks like to me? Let's see, markers, odds, Whoosh. two to one, we'll take that any day of the week. So that looks like a two to one attack, thanks to the small units helping the large units attack through the single hex side. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, building up units in... Frank Chadwick's ETO is handled through their table of organization and equipment. 
So, yeah, T, O, and E. Good. Let's see if we can take a look at that here for the axis. You get your equipment through the change box. And this is how we organize. One Panzer Army equals two Panzer Corps. And then down here, when you break corps down in divisions, one Panzer Corps gives you two Panzer Divisions and a motorized division, or after 1942, 1943 or later, that is, the uh, motorized divisions are all flipped into, not isolated units, flipped into Panzer Grenadiers, so they flip. But they're not there yet. This is earlier in the war right now. Notice that only certain units can build up and break down. You can only form the larger army size units that are in the change box and you can only break down the core, the medium sized units, into the small ones as shown here and that's basically your mobile forces uh, the Hungarians, the Romanians, and of course the dreaded German Panzer Corps and the elite German Mountain Corps can break down into three component mountain divisions. So if we wanted to build up. Let's talk about building up units first. Building up units means having the right unit stacked together in the hex to form a larger unit. For example, in this hex we have the 3rd Panzer Corps and the 46th Panzer Corps. The trouble with organizing two units into a larger unit, the downside to that is you do that at the beginning of your regular movement phase. The phases are pretty simple. Uh, logistics, special movement, combat, regular movement. It's not a complicated sequence of play. But the beginning of your regular movement phase is after combat. So you basically organize this turn, you build up this turn to use them next turn. Uh, so these two German uh, panzer units, panzer corps, would organize with a panzer army. So this guy would come on the map and replace these two guys. So they would be out, he would be in. Now you'll notice, let me drag these guys back here for a second, if you look at the sum of the parts you'll see that by combining these two panzer corps into this panzer army you keep their attack strength. It stays at 12 and 12 is 24 and the beauty of this is you've built a, a, a hammer that you can send all 24 of those factors through a single hex, hex side when you attack. You couldn't do that if the panzers were stacked together. You could only have one hit per hex side. So by concentrating, you really mass up a lot of attack strength. But look at the defense factors. 9 and 9 would normally be 18. But you lose two defense factors by combining them into a panzer army. So they're a little more inefficient. And since you have to do that during your regular movement phase, which it's then the opponent's turn and they're going to get to a chance to attack, you actually weaken the defense in that hex. So something to be aware of uh, when you combine guys. By the way, there's another Panzer Army up here that could combine. So let's do that because, hey, we're going we're gonna to build big Panzer Armies out here, kids. And that's the name of that tune. So this guy is in. These guys are out. Whoosh. All right. Ooh, Moscow looking threatened. Okay. Um, the other way you build up forces is for the Soviets. The Soviets have uh, shock armies, rifle armies, and guards infantry armies that build up by just adding replacements to them. So a Soviet core, if you add a replacement point to it, becomes a two-step Soviet army. So for example, this Soviet core, if we add a Soviet personnel point to it, it gets exchanged out. The core becomes an army by adding one personnel point to it. Armies, such as this shock army, if you add a personnel point to it, it flips up 
from its two-step side, these little dots in the corner, to its three-step side. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, the trouble with the Soviet armies is they're armies, which means you cannot stack two of them in a hex. The Soviets could not combine these two armies in the same hex and, and concentrate their defense and firepower. So armies have a tendency to be unwieldy, and organizing these Soviet leg armies, the ones with the black movement allowance, means that a German unit can throw its zone of control on it, grab a hold of that Soviet leg unit, and vice versa, and it cannot move in the special movement phase. This chap over here, who is not in an enemy zone of control, during the special movement phase, before combat, can move up to two, can move half his movement allowance. So that gives them some maneuverability. By keeping unengaged reserves off of your front line, you get uh, extra flexibility during your turn in where to commit them and how. That is how you build up in a nutshell. Oh, and look at this. The Soviets have a guard cavalry unit, which is a, a flipped over regular cavalry unit, and a regular tank army, and check this out. If you look at the Soviet display in their change box, they can make a guard cavalry plus a regular tank creates a cav mech group. And that's exactly what they want to do. So these guys are out. This guy is in. Boom. And now the Soviets, too, are combining their forces. Now, the neat thing about a cav mech group is um, it is a large, or uh, major, excuse me, heavy unit. Heavy units are the ones with the armor oval in them, you know, panzers, tanks, things like that. Well, the Cav Meg group, the Soviets really have a dearth of large mech units. They have plenty of small ones. These little 316 tank corps, man, they're everywhere. They're buzzing around like bees around a jam pot. But medium and large units are harder to come by. The large units, the Soviet tank armies, they won't even see those uh, whoops, wrong mat, until later in the war, and they could build these massive tank armies and have them playing around. But uh, they, they can be organized later. For right now, early in the war, the best the Soviets can do is pull together these little cab mech groups. But the beauty of that is, is it has a heavy zone of control in the six hexes around it. The good thing about a heavy zone of control is... Armor units can trace supply and retreat through non-heavy enemy zone of control hexes. So if this Panzer Army were here and forced to retreat, it could go there without suffering a step loss and then one more hex back. Because there's no units with a heavy zone of control here. If this guy had surrounded him and he had to retreat, he would go through one hex with the zone of control, you know, two hex with the zone of control, and each hex is another step loss that you got to take. So he would flip down to there, and it would be nasty. You, you don't want that. So let's put him back before the Germans start crying. That's building up, and why you want to do that is to, to build hammers so that you can really force a lot of factors through a single hex site. Um, building up for the Germans who have to assemble units and for the Soviet cab mech groups is hard to do because, like I said, you do it at the beginning of the regular movement phase. If your guys don't happen to be stacked together at that time because they got their hair messed up in combat or you just didn't think about it, well, too bad because you need some forethought to uh, assemble a large unit. Um, to, to simply beef up a guy is easy. Beefing up people, flipping this, this guy into an 8-4, that's easy. But assembling parts together to build the larger troops, that's trickier. All right, breaking down is a lot easier because you can break down at pretty much any time. You can break down during your special movement phase at before you start moving the unit, you can uh, break down when you advance after combat. You can break down in your regular movement phase. So if we wanted to break down this second Panzer Army, 
we just do the opposite of what we did before. We'd uh, grab those two Panzer units, whoosh, and we get rid of the second Panzer army, put those guys back. And now the beauty of being broken down is you can move in different directions. You can cover more terrain. You've got zones of control uh, out farther. That's the advantage of breaking down. But here's another important advantage. When you break down, and uh, you can you can break down multiple times, is it allows you to do this. I'm going to break down this German. Let's say they're not attacking. Let's say we are on the offense, and we want to clobber this guy. right? Unfortunately, this Panzer unit is interdicted, so he is not going to be much use. He's half-strength attacking. What we're going to do is try and raise some additional factors, though. We're going to break down the third Panzer Corps into its component parts. So, on the axis display, we see a Panzer Corps breaks down into two Panzer divisions. One, two, and a motorized division. And this Panzer Corps goes away, and these three divisions pop in. None of which have a zone of control, remember. But... You can contribute them through the hex side of attack. So, for example, over here, we can only get six attacking, whether we use the uh, deflated 24th Panzer Corps or the uh, wounded 40th Panzer Corps. But one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, by doing that, we've got 28 points that can attack through this hex side and clobber that guy all by themselves. 26 points ain't bad. So that's 26 to 5 is a 5 to 1. And then add 10 more factors from this guy and that guy. Now you're now you're talking real odds here. Now you're talking a 7 to 1 attack. And that is going to get the job done. Whoops, 7 to 1 odds. Boom. Because we broke down this panzer unit and sent a division off to help the battle here. We could have put it here. We could have put it there. It doesn't matter. As long as it's that second unit attacking through the hex side and adding its factors in, that's what makes it key. That's the critical deal. Now, yeah, we can move forward with these, but being weak to defense and having no zones of control means they're likely to get crushed. So it's it's often better to send your panzers and, uh, and other units as support guys to, to help larger units. Um, so when you break down, it's like to have some handy pocket change to help you find the right odds. This is why these Soviet cavalry corps are so annoying, because a, a big army uh, backed up by a, a cavalry corps, you know, that's that's a lot of extra factors. And then this guy will add a little tank corps. Uh, so now this is a 10 and that's an 11 attacking. Those, those little cores are just the right supplements for big Soviet armies. Breaking down uh, is easy, and it really helps you when you try and put the odds together for an attack. But it's also really useful for advance after combat. So, for example, the Soviets can't break down their raised forces. They, they don't break down because they were not assembled. An assembled army could break down. So let's say that these guys attack over here and push this guy out of the hex, destroy his little trench, and now they want to advance after combat. Well, if the Germans advance with that 6-4, that leaves this kind of weak and vulnerable. Uh, the Hungarians, though, nobody cares if they take a loss, and that's a combined unit. So what that can do is break down before it advances, because if you advance with everything, that's pretty dangerous. But if you advance with just half of an assembled unit. Ah. That Hungarian 6-3 equals these two 4-4s. Four so let's, or no, not two 4-4s, four a 2-4-3 so and a 4-4. Four four. So let's do this. We're going to break this guy down, put these guys over here, and now we're just going to advance this guy after combat and leave him to mind the back door. You can only advance one unit after combat unless it's a breakthrough. So that guy's going to advance, and then in the uh, regular movement phase, one, two, three, four, this guy will help keep that hex strong. And uh, the Hungarians will probably push that guy forward too. Ugh. So hopefully, 
and then and next turn, <laughs> theoretically, this is a stack that could combine. So now it's just a matter of seeing how the Soviets react to that, you know, who they bring in and, and how many factors and whatnot. But breaking down is not just for making handy change for an attack, it's also for advance after combat. Uh, the other neat thing about uh, breaking down is if a small unit dies, let's say this, uh, this German Cavalry Corps or Mountain Infantry Division, there we go, is killed in combat. These 14 factors clobber this guy at 7 to 1. All right? And that's the end of this guy. He goes poof. Well, when he's in the German force pool and you buy him back, he can come in in any friendly city in that theater. When you buy a major unit back, uh, a core, out of your force pool, it has to appear in your home country. Stop it. Let's say that this 51st Corps uh, was flipped to reduced and then killed. Boom. When he's in your force pool, the force pool, access display, force pool. When you buy a, um, a, a core from the force pool, oh my goodness, and the Germans have got some nasty stuff in here. That costs uh, a full replacement point, equipment for, for tanks, plus a fuel point to get a tank out of the force pool, or uh, an infantry step, an infantry replacement point for a core, and obviously you take the good ones out before the, the inferior ones. But those guys, these major units, have to appear in Germany and be railed up to the front. A small unit, such as this recently eliminated cavalry division, you can build it on any city in the theater where you spent the replacement point. Now that's real convenient because that would allow this guy to would be replaced for one half a point because he's a small unit. Major units cost a full point, minor units only cost a half. And bang! He's right back near the front lines where you need him, when you need him. So that's the other good thing about having some small units around is when they die, they pop back up like those inflatable punching clouds when you were a kid. Anyway, that is a quick look at stacking, organization, buildup and breakdown, and why you have fun with it. Uh, look for the article in the Player's Guide on building them up and breaking them down. This is Alan Emmerich from Victory Point Games saying thanks, and I hope you enjoyed my first tutorial.